Comunque, allora, io da buon soggetto diasporico, eh, università, un universitario migrante, insomma la mia presentazione sarà in lingua inglese, eh, quindi mi dispiace, insomma, un po'. Um, so, the title of the presentation is Fragmented Masculinities on the Move. Um, I want to do quite a few things in this paper, so maybe a bit too many, um, so bear with me. It's really, so, some of them are just initial thoughts. Um, I, I want to focus on the importance of analytically complementing the study of gender relations and not only masculinities with an intersectional approach when we talk about, when we examine the lives of migrants. Um, and when we talk about the life of migrants vis-a-vis -vis the uh, immigration institutions, but also uh, within the broader society, so when they start living their lives in the new country. Um, and so to do so, I will refer to my uh, project, um, which is uh, just finished, um, called uh, Embodied Borders, uh, Problematizing Sexual Humanitarianism. Uh, now, I will uh, keep on doing similar work from January 2017 on a different project, um, uh, which looks mostly at uh, migration and trafficking. But I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Okay, so let's start with the concepts. So this is uh, the concept with which uh, myself and my colleague, uh, Nicola Mai, uh, work with um, in order to examine um, what uh, Nicola Mai uh, refers to as the ways in which migrants are increasingly understood and targeted by the media, policy makers and social interventions and as being subject to violence and exploitation because of their gender identity and because of their sexual behaviors. So this sexual humanitarian discourses, you can read this uh, uh, brief um, uh, you know, uh, explanation of the concept. Um, this discourses repeatedly increase the vulnerability of the population that they aim to rescue, particularly through the criminalization and deportation processes that they enforce. So the sexual humanitarian mechanism, it's a mechanism, a dispositif uh, in the Foucauldian sense of the term, which administers people's testimonies. Um, and that is basically migrants have to be proficient self-narrators, as Dani pointed out. They have to self-narrativize um, when providing their accounts to the institutions, um, which then will grant them or not uh, the right of residence or asylum in a specific country. Um, so in my research, which is mostly based in the UK and in France, um, uh, what happens is that um, in a very non-convivial context, uh, so I'll take the example of the United Kingdom uh, in the space of the Home Office, um, queer and gender non-conforming refugees have been subject to mistrust to acute scrutiny from the Home Office and the constant pressure of presenting themselves as genuine. So genu genuineness is a very important concept for, for, for this. Uh, again, Danny was referring to that you know, in, terms, in relation to the performance of uh, a genuine way of being. And uh, ironically, paradoxically, that uh, performance of genuineness has to be carefully crafted. So genuineness becomes important only if, uh, in the moment, that then you know, it becomes uh, very uh, studied and analyzed and embodied uh, in different ways. Um, so mm, the problem with um, sexual orientation and gender identity, where many lawyers uh, that I interview say it's um, claims that are easy to make and very difficult to prove. Um, so the, the problem is that it's not different from any other sort of refugees applications, you know, it's the same predicament of the one of being believed, uh, becoming credible subjects. However, with gender identity and sexual orientation is that there's sincerity, uh, yes, it, it's definitely harder to prove because of the intimate, you know, extra intimate level uh, on which we are operating. Um, so, 
Um, as a researcher working on asylum, I've been uh, extensively, uh, I've been working with the personal narratives uh, of, of refugees, which often uh, tend to become humanitarian scripts uh, in the processes of institutional certifications. The asylum context uh, altogether is all about narratives. Um, refugees produce narratives and co-produce narratives. Um, they, the stories um, are not only individual stories, but they become subject to uh, a, a, a sort of tight um, web of uh, interactions. So that we have the lawyers, the support workers, the NGO workers, uh, you know, and the stories then have to be presented uh, within very formal uh, legal uh, contexts. Um, so, um, from an analytical point of view, which is paradoxical, because today I am going to talk about personal narrative, but what I'm saying now is that um, focusing uh, particularly, predominantly on um, migrants' narratives presents many limits. Because today there is an abundance of representations of refugee stories. Uh, but most of them, however, are still predicated upon a dimension of suffering and trauma. So here there's an amazing work uh, done by Didier Fassin and uh, Richard Reckman uh, called The Empire of Trauma, where they look at, uh, particularly at the situation of post-traumatic disorder, uh, P PTSD, as a category which is mobilized within this, uh, um, you know, to give, to validate or not uh, a particular story within the certification processes of uh, refugees. Um, anyway, so th there is an abundance of, the, of, of this particular type of uh, traumatized and suffering um, uh, subjectivity uh, in the asylum process. And um, we have also to acknowledge that academic researchers also fall into the trap of contributing to produce even more one-dimensional representations of the refugee. So we, we are uh, co-producing that. Um, okay. Now, to, 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 to stress again, uh, emphasize the importance of Danny's work, um, it's important to say that all too often asylum and social protection categories, uh, provisions in the EU, are granted on, basic, uh, on the basis of stereotypical and racialized understandings of victimhood and gender relations. So not just gender role, but also how we present as victims. Um, um, so in a way, we still need to produce, it's important to produce complex counter-narratives on, on the part of the, the person who's going through the, the, the administrative procedures of claiming asylum. So now, uh, having done this premise, uh, I would like to move on to the um, case study, um, so to speak, uh, the, 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 the presentation of one of my respondents' uh, stories. Um, this person is a, an aging trans uh, sex worker, from originally from Algeria, um, and she uh, lives in Paris with no papers, uh, and she does street work. So this is we're talking about street work, uh, se sex work. Um, uh, so I claim that the way that she tells, how she tells her biography, radically questions assumptions about the fixity of masculinity at the level of self-understanding, embodiment, and relationality. Um, in fact, I do think that her narrative uncovers the embodied and in-place dimensions of gender presentations. So, um, just to summarize a little bit my interaction with uh, the, this respondent. So, her name is Jarive. Uh, Jarive has um, been working in, uh, in the sex industry now since the early 90s. Um, she works in a camionette, which is a, a, a van. Um, so th th this happens in the Bois de Boulogne uh, in the outskirts of Paris, notorious historical place where street work happens. Um, uh, she's been living in different places. So before going to Paris, her migratory trajectory is quite complex. So she came to Italy, she lived in Napoli, she lived in Torino, then she moved to Marseille, and then now in Paris. 
Um, she, so the, uh, when she moved to, to France, I mean, Italy, she left because uh, it, it was uh, pure troubles, uh, a lot of drugs, and uh, the, the, the work wasn't going very well. She had to leave. This was in the um, late 90s. Uh, um, beginning of the two, uh, year 2000s, she moves to, to Marseille. She tries to um, um, regular, regularize her status, uh, to get papers, uh, uh, asking for uh, asile territorial. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, because of a criminal record, uh, she couldn't apply because she was caught by some policemen without papers. So she, she basically, even though she was a trans-Algerian person, which uh, in France it means that you are um, a protected category, uh, so she could have applied easily for um, for asylum, uh, being trans and being Algerian. Uh, because of the criminal record, she couldn't. And then she could have, but she was afraid of being um, deported. So that is, uh, you know, here we're, talk we're thinking about Nico uh, Nicola de Genova talks about deportability as this, uh, the fear of being deported at any minute, you know, which is what characterizes, you know, the, the limits of uh, uh, citizenship, right? You know, sort of how we relate to it. Um, so, um, anyway, after some time, she, she dropped her asylum case, too complex. Um, I'm just hiding, hiding, I'm going underground, and that's how I live. Um, she gets in touch with a, a trans organization in Paris because she's tired of not having papers. She wants to sort out the situation. Um, so she goes to the, 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 this uh, trans organization, and also she gets in touch with the Stras. Stras is the um, union of sex workers uh, in, in France, uh, so she, she gets in touch with them as well. Um, anyway, she said to me that when she went to the trans organization in Paris, uh, which is mostly working with Latin American trans sex workers, uh, she tells me that uh, she feels ignored uh, by the people there. Um, firstly, because she is not HIV positive, Secondly, because she had not had bottom surgery, she had not had uh, vaginoplasty, um, and because she is from Algeria, she is not uh, Latin America. So all this uh, thing, so she, she is seen to be almost French by the Latin American counterparts in the organization. She felt that the people that weren't taking her seriously, that she was just waiting in the waiting room and um, nothing was going to happen, she dropped the case again. So this is the second time that she decides, okay, I can't deal with this, um, it's too complex. Now, there are many ways, many angles from which I could discuss Jarive's story to you. But I want to focus on two uh, specific dimensions, uh, which are the ones identified by Connor and Messersmith um, in their uh, analysis of hegemonic and non-hegemonic masculinities. So I want to focus on two things. One is geography, so, which I talk about more as emplacement. And the second one is embodiment, which I look at from a social, social embodiment. So th this focus, uh, I hope, may unpack how as a trans-feminine, financially very precarious sex worker, um, masculinity has impacted and continues to impact her life consistently, and how uh, Jarive relates to certain types of masculinity in very contextual ways. So very contextually. So in terms of emplacement, um, I want to think about the importance of place, uh, as in studied by the geographer Doreen Massey. Um, in, uh, so place as in giving the conditions for a different enact enactment of gendered behaviors. Um, so what does it mean, if we think about Jarif's story, what does it mean to occupy different subject positions? Now the thing that we always say, occupying different subject positions, what does it mean actually in practice? Um, firstly, we might think of the process of migration, so for example, the possibility that are opened up to Jarive in the migratory trajectory, so from uh, her hometown in Algeria to uh, Italy and then to France. Um, oh, I forgot this. Oh, no, 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 but I need to, I need to, I need to read this to you. Um, shall I do that now? Yeah. 
So this is, uh, uh, yes, okay, so this is exactly, sorry, I'll go back for a second, okay, so in placement, we'll, we'll go back to it. This is when Jarive went to the trans organization um, uh, in Paris, is it? Wait, 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 translator. <laughs> no, 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 this is, this is something else. I'll, I'll go back to it later, okay. So, um, okay, with Jarive, we had a mix of uh, linguistic exchanges. So she, she obviously speaks uh, Italian because she was living here and she speaks very well. She speaks French, uh, English as well. So we, we, it, it was a, a real mix. So that's what she tells me. Quando sono andata là ho perso tutta la mattina. So that's the, the trans organization in Paris. Poi ti danno un altro rendezvous. Il faut aller là-bas à nouveau. Alors là, elles ne sont pas stables dans leur travail. Si j'ai les sida, alors tout de suite. Si je vais faire la chatte, alors tout de suite. Ils, font, ils vont le faire. Uh, on m'a dit, oh, tu veux faire la chatte Alors oui, oui, ça, ça va. Alors je ne veux pas faire la chatte. Car dans leur tête, elles ne sont pas normales. Mais moi, je ne suis pas normal. La vérité, on est des hommes et on est des femmes au même temps. Si tu vas là et tu dis que tu veux faire la chatte, elles te reçoivent bien. Elles sont très contentes. So, I don't know. La chatte chat is the vagina. Uh, so, that's, that's, that's the key word. I mean, that's the way she felt excluded in that space. Right? So, it's, it's the lack of, uh, you know, having a vagina. So, it's not, not being the right kind of trans person in that space. Um, obviously, this is the way that she internalized that, that intersubjective um, relation in that, in that space. Um, okay, so... Now, back to emplacement. I'll, I'll go back to, to this thing. So, uh, I told you, I, I'm trying to do too many things, so it's a bit uh, disorganized, but I'm, you know, try, we'll, try, we'll, we'll put the strings together in a minute. Um, so, so, that, 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 that's, that's, so firstly, in, if we think about space, we think about migration. So, for example, Jarive's possibility in France and not the ones that she had in her hometown. Uh, when she was younger, she was, um, uh, when she was growing up in her town in, in Algeria, uh, people knew that she was queer. No, she, it, was, it was clear. Uh, today, she becomes uh, unintelligible to her mother, uh, and she is a pede, a queer, um, queer person, to her father. But however, when she talks to her brother on the phone, the brother that she's never met, because she has already left uh, Algeria, she's a man, so she's not Jarive, but she's Mohammed. So she's talking to her brother on the phone, being Mohammed. So that's how um, she says. Uh, now I never think to go back to Algeria. Last time I talked to my mother on the phone, I told her, why don't you ever ask me when I'll come back? And she said to me, and where will I put you? With the men or with the women? And then I told her what, that my place is neither among men nor with women. Enough is enough. I've always felt exploited by all my family. I pray God every day that my father will die before me. He's 85 and is still there. I have a brother there. I talk to him on the phone every now and then. He does not know me. Il a 28 ans. Il ne sait pas ce que je suis. Il ne sait pas ce que je fais. Alors je parle. Il me parle. I speak like a man to him. I put on my big voice. Oui, oui, ça va. So that's the way that she, she, she's framing that kind of, uh, and she's leaving that masculinity in a very fragmented way, which is also allowed by uh, technology in this case. And also the, the, uh, the fact, you know, we always talk about visibility, but also we should talk about the importance of invisibility. In this case, this is something that she, it's important to her because she's not, seen, she, it's the impossibility of being seen by the brother that allows her to have a relationship with the brother. So that, that's another dimension to think about. Um, so in the past 20 years in Paris, uh, Jarive has met many people like her. That's what she says, people like me, uh, from different parts of the world. So people like me, meaning trans people doing sex work, street work, etc. Um, but the people like her, uh, as we've seen in the organization, uh, also my 
exclude her. Uh, it's not a given that she will feel home or belonging necessarily in the, you know, amongst the people like her. Um, so she felt excluded for two things, um, for her nationality, she's Algerian, she's not Latin American, and her genitals, and that's the second point, so body and geography, again. Um, further, as I've argued, uh, place, um, I think it's important to understand it beyond its geographical meanings, and it should be thought about uh, also as a very specific social location, as a context. Um, so I think of emplacement in terms of how place has affected Jarive's own gender presentation. So you have many Jarive. I mean, I noticed that when I was accompanying her to the Ofpra, which is the place where she could get papers from you know, the administration in France, the, the police stations when she's in the flat, so you have the Jarive at the Ofpra, the, the Jarive at the police station, Jarive in the in her own apartment, she arrived at the uh, when while working in the in the Bois de Boulogne, uh, she arrive in when she's talking on the phone with her brother uh, and with the family. So here we can see how locally, regionally, and globally situated knowledges or influences co-produce discourses and practices that become available to Jariv today. Now that's very important. Now this is the, as I frame emplacement. Um, now, thinking about embodiment, um, so Jarive, obviously there is a question of a trans embodiment of femininity to be taken into account. Um, yet, this is strongly intertwined with other dimensions, such as um, the lack of European whiteness and the constant precarity of street sex work. Um, and now, even more precarious uh, after the criminalization of clients. So, I don't know if you know, the law in France has criminalized uh, people who buy sex um, particularly, obviously, street workers are the ones who are mostly affected because they are the most visible ones uh, and the most precarious ones. So we precarize the ones who are already uh, yeah, extremely vulnerable. Unfortunately, here we have very, uh, it's a very poisonous, I would say, to say the least, a kind of a debate because it involves also uh, an important uh, instrumentalization of, of particular feminism. Mm. So there is a hegemonic feminist discourses that has been instrumental, instrumental in creating uh, stigma, more stigma uh, around sex work. So that, that's been very problematic. Anyway, um, I want to show you quickly something in relation to uh, European whiteness and embodiment. And here I want to show you, it's, uh, it's the work that my colleague Nicola Mai, who is an anthropologist and a filmmaker, has done, uh, again, with a trans-Algerian sex worker. Uh, I mean, we also interview other people, but in this case, it's uh, also trans-Algerian uh, sex workers in Marseille. So I'll show you the trailer of uh, this uh, uh, um, ethno-fiction. So it's a, it's a documentary that uses ethnographic data. Oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, using ethnographic data, but also using uh, actors and, uh, and and a script, so in order to trouble also the meanings of documentary making, as in like that which tell us the truth about a story. So anyway, this is just uh, uh, the trailer. <laughs> Oui, ça fait vraiment longtemps que je te vois pas. Je t'ai appelé, tu sais, je t'ai cherché partout. Mmh. Tu étais où Et Des fois, je commence tôt et je rentre chez moi si j'ai assez de clients. Moi, je veux changer de vie. Bientôt, tu vas plus me voir ici. C'est bon, dès que j'ai les papiers, je rentre en Algérie, je travaille plus tout ça. Je sais pas comme ces putes là-bas, tu sais. Moi, je suis un vrai mec, comme mon père. Elles, leurs parents, c'est des putes et des PD. Ils acceptent, c'est comme les Français. Bon, quand même, ma chérie, tu te vois comme ça, un vrai mec, ça fait pas trop. <rire> Pardon si ça rigole, mais. Tu dis ça parce que t'es français. Je suis pas français, moi je suis italien, tu le sais bien. Je sais que t'es italien, mais quand même, t'es français. Tes parents, ils acceptent que t'es pédé, non Oui, mais on arrivait là doucement, tu sais. Avec ma mère, c'était plus facile, mais avec mon père, hein, il a fallu comme 30 ans. Hein. Ouais, ouais, ouais. Moi, c'est pas comme ça. Moi, je suis algérien. 
D'accord Et je suis un vrai mec comme mon père. Exactement. Attends, qu'est-ce qu'il veut, lui il, il arrête pas de repasser depuis tout à l'heure. Je te laisse tranquille, chérie. Hein tu ouais. dois travailler ouais. Ok, j'y vais. Ouais. Bon, oui, j'y vais, euh, je t'appelle. Okay. Okay. Merci. Ciao. 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 So, European whiteness. So, Nicola is Italian, but is French. It's the same thing, in a way. For, for Samira, it's, uh, that's the way she positions herself towards uh, the, the ethnographer, mm-hmm. going there, asking questions uh, about, uh, you know, her work and, uh, you know, uh, etc. Um, so, um, Jarib, like uh, Samira, this fictional character who's not so fictional, it's actually a very real character, it's, uh, someone that uh, Nicola interviewed uh, in Marseille over the years. Um, tell us to think about masculinity in relation to whiteness and the colonial space, the colonial enduring impact of the colonized subject's self-understanding as negatively different, perhaps negative, we, we can discuss that. Um, so when she says to Nicola, you're French, but you wouldn't understand, it doesn't matter if you're Italian. The embodiment for Jarive uh, means also many other things, you know, so this is, this is an important space and I'd like you to, you know, ask me more questions, I'm not uh, indulging too much on that. Uh, embodiment also means relating to her physical beauty. Uh, as she is growing old, she's an aging person, she's in her 50s and um, she sh- continuously shows me pictures about when she was younger and slimmer uh, and she looks at them with visible nostalgia. Um, uh, so that, that was an important part of our interaction. So what was there in the past is not here in the present, I don't know about the future. So that kind of temporal dimensions of uncertainty. Um, so when trying to regularize her papers, Jarif gave up many times, as we've seen. She reads her story as not being able to successfully cross the humanitarian border. So um, she's HIV negative, uh, she's from the wrong country. She sees herself as a, a trans person, but different, because she doesn't have vaginoplasty. When I say humanitarian border, I mean the limitations which are imposed when narrating one's biography in order to get documents, in order to get papers. And this is co-produced by the legal support system, as uh, Dani emphasized, the institutional interface, the border control administration. She's not the right kind of transsexual, neither for the authorities, nor for the other trans people. Please don't confuse uh, Jarib with um, uh, with Samira. There's overlaps, but they're two different subjects and different stories. Of course, in order to make sense of the complexity of how, for example, Jarib relates to the humanitarian border, an intersectional standpoint is crucial. So this is important to think through the multiple points of oppression that mark Jarib's story. Also, the, the ones that she perceived coming from those people and institutions which should have protected her. They should have been there to protect her, to give her a safe space, so to speak. Um, the study of masculinity, more in general, must be relational. That's your point that, that you highlighted. We learn from gender and sexuality scholars, many of whom are here today in the room, that it has to be relational. But I say not only relational to femininity, but It's a relationality that should reveal that masculinity is entangled in a tight web of connection, practices and discourses that make up and reproduce white patriarchy and capitalism. Then we should ask the question, how do we study gender dynamics and roles in placing them within a deep analysis of other ways people can be oppressed? So looking at masculinity from an intersectional standpoint could help us situate masculinity within the histories of feminist-oriented epistemologies which are already there. But again, intersectionality also presents us with some questions. 
Uh, intersectionality has uh, been uh, um, extremely used in academia, in activist networks over the past few years. It's something that black feminists have been using since a long time, without naming it. Uh, but, you know, Angela Davis, Audre Lorde, and, you know, there is a whole history before Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term in, in the sort of more kind of legalistic terms. Um, um, intersectionality, uh, you know, has been accused to, um, to, to, of, of many people things because of its various applications. In a way, you can say it's a bit like what happened to hegemonic masculinities. You know, it's one of those big framing of big co concepts that uh, there are applications that confuse and ob obfuscate the origin, original meanings. Um, in a way, uh, it's been criticized uh, as being a nuanced form of identity politics. Um, but we know that originally the term stood against identity politics. Uh, for example, let's think the, the, the history of black feminists on the position of radical and liberal feminists in relation to the universalist notion of womanhood. That was through intersectionality that these feminists were sort of highlighting the problems with white feminism. Um, so that's, uh, uh, we, we, we see the intersectionality refocus attention on systems and structures rather than identity of the individuals. So the oppressions forming at a structural level. So taking into account uh, the differences where, uh, you know, okay, the intersectionality, um, uh, what, what could we say? that? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to summarize for you because it's too long. Uh, <laughs> that my critique of intersectionality as it is today is that sometimes it can become easily an, an empty signifier. So, and when I, uh, I ask myself, what is it that intersectionality cannot do, and I cannot answer the question, then it's because I'm stretching the term too much, to cover too much. I try, I try to make it function with, 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 with too many things. Um, so it's always important to locate the term intersectional or intersectionality whenever we use it. What is it that intersectionality allows me to mobilize in a particular situ situation with Jarive, for example? Um, uh, otherwise, it's not helpful analytically. So, does cultivating the concept of intersectionality to, to analyze a topic produce a particular sensibility on the part of, of, of the researcher. So in, order, in, in a way, it's what I'm trying to say is that intersectionality is often used as a grid of um, additive grid, sort of gender, race, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how we, we apply it without thinking about the sensibility of the researcher using it uh, while operating it in the field work and also when thinking about the data uh, in, 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 in the second phase. So with Jarive, a sensibility informed by an intersectionality standpoint was at work at all times. With her in the field work, there were limits. I think that she only gave me um, uh, the information she that she would give to a researcher. She didn't let me enter a deeper participative relationship. So was I letting her down as the people at the organizations did? Uh, despite these limits, my interaction with Jarif uh, might be in there around uh, in, in, the, in, in the field work, lingering uh, in her silences, talking to her at work and outside of work, suspending my urge to understand at all times, therefore destabilizing my researcher position through humor and sharing my own autobiographical anecdotes helped me see new things about street work that I didn't know and that I couldn't have known otherwise, uh, and to see also the contradictions, the antagonisms, uh, which circulated in the space that Jarib was occupying, within the street work space and without. So I I'll just leave it here, and thank you. Nostro relatore invisibile è arrivato ora. E, e, e chiederei vabbè, e, adesso raccogliamo le domande molto rapidamente e però a questo punto chiederei a Piero Verni di stringere moltissimo perché noi non, non avendoti visto non avendoti sentito ci siamo presi il tempo nel, nella speranza di poter poi dedicare spazio al dibattito, quindi ti chiedo, um, è un peccato perché 
il tuo intervento è interessante però non avendo avuto eh, segni di vita a questo punto eh, sarebbe altrettanto un peccato eh, comprimere eccessivamente il dibattito grazie, grazie no, eh, passando da, da Deni che in qualche modo ho provato come anche le istituzioni forniscono degli account che, gli, che i soggetti utilizzano per soggettivarsi, chiedevo invece eh, a, a Calogero di approfondire un po' di più questo rapporto eh, di coproduzione tra, la tua, tra il tuo posizionamento, la tua maschilità e eh, Jariv, ah. eh, cioè in che modo cioè sì. la, la relazionalità, perché... Sì. Tu hai parlato di maschilità, non so se in maniera paradossale, il sì. che sarebbe interessante proprio per mettere in discussione simbolicamente maschile e femminile, ma qui dov'è la femminilità mm -hmm. o il femminile? Cioè non lo utilizzi perché vuoi non utilizzare più queste due categorie oppure... Beh, dopo, dopo, sì. Oppure, punto interrogativo. Ok, grazie. Altre domande, interventi? In complimento, why have you chose uh, fragmented masculinities in this case of this, this transsexual and not fragmented Feminity. feminities? Yes, yes. That's a good question, thank you. Altre domande? Allora, se non ci sono altre domande lascerei... Ah, sì, scusa. Uh, just to compliment Dolores' uh, demand... Um, do you consider that fragmented whatever? For example, like I, I normally talk about fragmented bodies or overflown bodies, overflown discourses. I mean, we can use as many adjectives as we want. Um, would that adjective just applies to the particular case of migrant trans? that are not from Latin America, for example, or a, that is a category that you could expand to other cases. Thank yeah. you. Okay. That's Molto brevemente, sul rischio del termine eh, intersezionalità come significante vuoto. Mm, questa, questo stesso tipo di processo non è anche in atto rispetto per esempio alla sigla LGBT che ha piacimento può essere estesa a seconda delle sensibilità di, di, di chi parla ma soprattutto al di là di questo rischio eh, come eh, cerchiamo di muoverci rispetto invece a degli altri soggetti magari istituzionali che invece vi fanno ricorso. <coughs> 